at bare minimum, you should be meeting whatever the employer match is. So if your employer says, you know, we will put up to 6% match um, into your account, then you need to be contributing 6% so that you can get their 6%. And this is the reason that I say that. Whatever the employer matches, they consider that to be part of your compensation package. And so if you are not contributing up to the max, then you're leaving part of your compensation on the table. And there's no reason to ever leave money on the table. Welcome back, Journey to Generational Wealth Gang. Today, we are going to talk about the things that if I could go back and tell myself anything about finances, what those things would be. Like I have previously said, I have done some serious financial foolery over the course of my life and there are certainly some things that I have learned and if I could tell my younger self um, some things about finances then I would love to and so therefore I'm going to go ahead and share some of those things with you all in hopes that you don't participate in the same financial foolery and make the same mistakes that I made um, as well as potentially learn some new things. Uh, all of the advice that I'm going to give, and maybe this isn't even advice, like these are just tips um, that I am going to provide. I didn't necessarily make bad decisions on all of it. Some of it I just didn't even know about and I've learned about it. And so it would definitely be something that I wish I had known about so I could tell my younger self so that I could be in a better place financially now. So let's go. Credit cards. Okay, so don't get a credit card for a stupid reason. Um, so if you watch my Financial Foolery College Edition, then you will have heard me say that I did participate in some financial foolery as it pertains to my very first credit card. So if you are in a position where you're going to get your very first credit card, or maybe it's not even your first credit card, maybe you already have some credit cards and you're thinking about getting a new one, I would definitely say, don't get a credit card for a stupid reason. So letting you in on some of my financial foolery. My first credit card I got when I was 18 years old and I got it uh, because I was heading out for the, so it was the summer of my freshman year, um, at the end of my freshman year and I was headed to an internship and I wanted my college boyfriend to have some entertainment for the summer so that he wouldn't seek alternative entertainment for the summer. And so I got a credit card so that I could purchase him a PlayStation. Um, and I will tell you that that was not a financially wise thing to do. It was just not a wise thing to do in general. Um, and so that's why I say I got my first credit card for a very stupid reason. Um, and while I had income coming in or I was planning to have income coming in because I was, it was a paid internship. I also had bills that I was going to have to pay as a result of that internship. And so I ended up paying interest on that PlayStation when I really should have never even purchased the thing in the first place um, because I never should have gotten a credit card in the first place um, because I didn't have the money to pay it off in full as soon as the bill came like the very first time. So that's why I say don't get a credit card for a stupid reason. If you can't pay the credit card off immediately, then you don't need it. Um, I know that there are several credit cards that offer like, you know, six months same as cash or three months same as cash or whatever the case may be. And there may be some validity to that. Um, so if you're not paying interest on the purchase, then, you know, I personally would say that that's fine. Where I say that you go wrong and basically void the sole purpose of having the credit card is if you end up having to pay interest on it. If you're going to pay more for the product um, on the long run than you would have in the short run, like it doesn't make sense to purchase it in the first place for me. Um, and so that's why I say don't get a credit card for a stupid reason. Like certainly if you need to purchase a washer and dryer, um, then that's a different story versus the situation that I was in. Okay, so next I would say um, don't give your credit card to anyone. Um, 
I understand that people are like, oh, but I trust this person. I would say, when I say no one, I literally mean no one, not even someone that you trust. So again, financial foolery, I will tell you. Um, again, I hope that you all learn from my mistakes because I'm not just sharing my financial foolery to be embarrassed. I'm sharing it in hopes to save someone else from making these same mistakes. So I was dating someone and I can't remember the exact like circumstances, but whatever the situation was, they needed to get to work and didn't have any gas. And for whatever reason, I couldn't like follow them to the gas station or go with them at the moment. So I just gave them my credit card and was like, you know, here, get gas, you know, give me a card back and everything will be fine. Um, so again, this is somebody that I trusted, so I didn't think twice about it. Um, and they didn't end up giving the card back. Again, I didn't think twice about it. I had honestly forgotten that I gave it to them, so it wasn't like they were holding my card hostage because I hadn't asked for it back. I wasn't thinking about it because, again, I trusted them. Well, some time passed, and I was notified by my credit card company that I had maxed my credit card out. And when I gave them the credit card, it was by no means maxed out. There was very little on the card. Um, or there was very little usage on the card. Um, so I immediately was like, oh my God, my card's been stolen. That's when I remembered that I had given the card to my boyfriend. And the long and the short of it was he maxed my card out. Um, and like I said, I trusted him. Um, now... When we had this conversation um, decades ago, um, you know, he was like, well, I got you some stuff as if that made it better. Um, his argument was that, you know, he had gotten, that, that he hadn't spent all the money, he had gotten me some things. So wherein I was under the impression that the coach bags that he had purchased me and that the tennis bracelet, and I think he had gotten me like a right hand ring, um, that these were all purchases he had made on his own with his money. I had actually made those purchases for myself because he had used my credit card to make them. So again, this is why I say don't give your credit card to anyone, um, even if you trust them. And I say this because like he didn't pay any of it back. He didn't help me pay any of it back. It was in my name. Um, it was my credit card. It impacted my credit. So he got away scot-free. So the things that he quote unquote purchased me as gifts, I ended up, you know, selling them. Honestly, I ended up selling them to try and help pay the debt back off. Um, and I also sold them because I didn't want them anymore because they didn't mean the same to me when I realized that, you know, I had bought them myself. Um, but as it pertains to the things that he got for himself, he got them out scot-free because like I said, he didn't help me pay any of the debt off um, and he didn't give me any money back for it. So like I said, learn from my mistakes. Never, ever, ever under any circumstance, give your credit card to anyone else. Um, so the next thing I would say is don't be generous to a fault. So don't, uh, you know, put others needs in front of your own and I would say this as it pertains to like to to a fault in some cases that's necessary but not all the time um so I would say that this goes beyond finances but just in general like don't don't be generous to a fault check your credit report annually so with all three credit bureaus you are able to get a free credit report each year and so I would say definitely make sure that you are requesting that credit report every single year because it helps you to know where you are, where you're going. You know, it helps you to know if there's any discrepancy on your credit report. Um, and if you're not seeing it on an annual basis or a consistent basis, then you don't know what's going on. And I would say that in the times that you want to go purchase a home or refinance your home or go purchase a car, like that shouldn't be the first time that you've seen your credit report in an extended period of time. Like you should go into those circumstances having a pretty good idea of where you are and what you have going on so that you don't have to worry about what's gonna happen or how things are gonna go or what your interest rate 
rate might potentially be or how it would be impacted because you're already on top of I know exactly what my credit score is I know exactly what's on my credit report like I've disputed things that shouldn't be on there I've had things corrected that need to be corrected and I'm good to go okay so the last thing I would say about credit is put a lock on your credit and the reason I suggest this is honestly as a safeguard um, I would say put a lock on your credit because it honestly helps to protect from um, identity theft, but it also provides an additional layer to kind of slow you down and make you think as it pertains to using your credit. So, you know, you, it, you, because it's locked and you have to actually unlock it, then you might think twice about, you know, do I need to apply for another credit card? It'll help. Uh, eliminate some impulsive behavior I guess is what my process is I certainly would say you know as soon as you gain access to your social security number so even as a you know teenager put a lock on your credit because you honestly never know and nowadays like you have to use your social security number for so many things you have to enter it in in so many occasions like you putting it on the internet when you're filling out forums and so on and so forth. So that's why I say just go ahead and put a lock on your credit. You do that through the credit bureau. Um, and that way, and like I said, you also have to undo it through the credit bureau. And I am able to do all of it via my phone. So it's not a super, you know, it's not a complex or, you know, arduous task to do. Um, so I would suggest just for the safeguard, put a lock on your credit. That way, like I said, it helps to safeguard you from identity theft and from so many other things. Um, so just a suggestion. Okay, so financing is next. I would say do not co-sign for anything for anyone. Um, just don't do it. When you co-sign for something, so like you co-sign so someone can get an apartment or you co-sign so that they can get a car or you co-sign so that they can get furniture. Um, literally, you know, you co-sign so that they can get a loan. Like, it's all attached to your credit. So if you co-sign, you're basically saying, hey, if this person doesn't pay their bill on time or if this person doesn't pay their bill, period, I will pay the bill to cover the debt um, so you're taking ownership of it and honestly it's not a 50 50 in my opinion you're taking a hundred percent ownership because you genuinely don't know what they're gonna do I know that when you do it you're thinking oh I trust this person because I would never co-sign for somebody that I didn't trust but you never know her people's circumstances change and maybe they were a hundred percent like they had every intention of paying the debt when they did the loan or when they you know made the purchase but then something happened and now they can't pay it back that doesn't make it disappear and it also doesn't make it not impact your credit because it's certainly still going to impact you and it's certainly still going to impact your credit I've heard people say that you know 20 years ago they you know co-sign for you know a family member to get into an apartment and now they have debtors reaching out to them for you know unpaid debts and they're like wait a minute what are you talking about like that happened so long ago and that's not my responsibility that's their responsibility no it is because you co-signed on it and you said I'll be responsible for the debt so don't don't co-sign for anyone the next thing I would say is if you're not going to co-sign for anyone, don't finance anything on behalf of anyone either. Um, <laughs> I know that it just may be like, oh, that's just, you know, common sense that you wouldn't finance anything for someone else. Um, but it's not necessarily common sense that you wouldn't finance something for someone else. Um, and I say it because it's financial foolery that I did. Um, so it was someone who, again, I knew that, you know, needed a vehicle and they, you know, didn't have good credit. Um, so they, you know, I guess what they qualified for was going to be outside of the pay range that they could pay for. 
Um, and so, you know, they, we talked and, you know, they were like, you know, this is what I can afford, so on and so forth. And my credit score was substantially better than theirs. And so I was like, okay, again, somebody that I trusted. And they ultimately ended up running off with the vehicle and subsequently it got impounded. And I only found out that it got impounded. And again, it didn't matter that they ran off with the vehicle because they had been paying the payments on it. So that didn't impact me. So long as you're paying the payments, I'm, I'm good to go because that was what our deal was. Um, well, when I guess something happened to the vehicle and it stopped working um, and they had taken it to a shipping yard or whatever and when they stopped being able to drive it because it was at the shipping yard, they stopped making the payments. Um, and it ultimately ended up getting impounded because it stayed at the shipping yard too long and because I was the registered owner of the vehicle, because I had financed the vehicle, then I got notified by the, basically the police department, the impound lot, that the vehicle was there, that it had been impounded, and that there was X impound fee on top of the fee for what it had been at the shipping yard or at the uh, mechanic yard. For, for whatever period of time that it was there. Um, and I was in complete and utter shock because I didn't know that any of this was happening. Like, it wasn't a situation where I even got a heads up that was like, hey, you know, X, Y, and Z happened to the car. Like, I'm just letting you know, or, you know, I can't afford it anymore. Like, we need to sell it. I mean, nothing. So I say all that to say, Put out the window that oh I you know put out the thought that you know oh I, I, I know I can trust this person like you are genuinely just never know um, and again circumstances change you may be able to trust them in one moment but in the next mo moment you may not be able to trust them and when you're doing things like co-signing and financing uh, things for people like it's impacting you on a whole different level, you know, beyond the trust factor, it's a long-term impact on yourself. And I had to cover the cost of getting the car out of impound. I had to cover the cost that, you know, for what it was um, in at the mechanic yard for. And I ultimately ended up, you know, selling it, trying to recoup some of that cost but I also had to continue and pay off the rest of the vehicle when I never had the vehicle in the first place. I never drove the vehicle in the first place. So that's why I'm saying just don't do it. It's not wise um, and it's not in your best interest. And, you know, I've heard other people make this statement, but like when you bring money into situations of like lending to people and so on and so forth, it can totally ruin relationships. Um, and this is a situation where that was the case because again, just, just don't do it. Invest early. Okay, so like oh so many people, I got my very first job when I was 13 years old. I worked for a member of my church who had a, an apartment cleaning business. So like when someone would move out of the apartment, then we would go in and we would clean up the apartments and make them ready for the next person to move in. So that was my very first job. And I, that was at 13. And I continued to work like beyond that point and I honestly have you know never stopped um in high school uh, as a high school senior what well, I had three jobs I worked uh for an amateur baseball stadium did I, I had two I, I had either two or three jobs so I worked for an amateur baseball street stadium um I worked for a clothing store and I want to say I did something else but I can't even remember what that is um so anyhow I've always had, you know, I've always worked. And I say invest early because had I known then what I know now, I would have started investing as soon as I could have, which would have been when I started making income at the age of 13. So I say that to say this right now, if you have a child who is working um, and has a legitimate job, so if that is that they work and they're like mowing lawns or they're cleaning out trash cans or they work for a fast food place or like legitimate anywhere else they're, you know, doing babysitting or whatever, they're legitimately making money, not 
the money that you pay them to do chores around the house, but they have an actual job. We open a custodial Roth IRA for them and have them start putting money into that Roth IRA. And you can contribute up to, or they can, yeah, you, you they can contribute up to $6,500 uh, annually as of 2023 into that fund. And this is the reason that I say this. Excuse me, because had I started um, doing that and $6,500 equates to about $125 a week. Now, you, your child may not be making $125 a week and that's perfectly fine. You don't have to put the maximum amount in there if they're not making it and they can't afford to do that. Any, like literally every little bit counts. And everything is, you know, anything that they put in there is going to have compounding interest. And right now, the market over time has consistently had, what, about a 7% average. Um, and so had I been doing that and had I uh, contributed that 125 a week starting, and I think I calculated it um, from like the age of 20. I didn't even start at the age of 13 when I did the calculation. So at the age of 20, if I had done it starting at the age of 20 all the way to the age, or uh, no, 22 all the way to the age of 62, so that's 40 years, then I would have accumulated a million dollars, over a million dollars, just from that $6,500 a year. Now that is not to, I mean, now to say that you as you earn more money, you're going to contribute more to your retirement fund. So needless to say, it would be, have been so much more. But that's why I, I say, like, investing is the long game. So the earlier you start, the longer you have for your money to grow and for interest to compound on top of it. So it just totally makes sense that you would start early Put whatever you can put in there in there. So 10% of your income, 15% of your income. The younger you are, the less financial responsibilities you have. So the more you technically should be able to invest. And that goes into my next point is when you start, you know, working your, I guess, quote unquote, adult job um, and you're working for a company that has a retirement plan, I would say put as much into that retirement plan as possible. At bare minimum, you should be meeting whatever the employer match is. So if your employer says, you know, we will put up to 6% match um, into your account, then you need to be contributing 6% so that you can get their 6%. And this is the reason that I say that. Whatever the employer matches, they consider that to be part of your compensation package. And so if you are not contributing up to the max, then you're leaving part of your compensation on the table. And there's no reason to ever leave money on the table, especially money that they're already like openly willing to give to you. All you have to do is just do your part and meet the match. And then I would also say, like I said before, the younger you are, the less financial obligations you have. So I would suggest putting 10 to 15% of your income into your retirement account. And the reason I say that is because over time you're going to, you know, life is going to occur and you're going to build up um, financial obligations. And so maybe late, a little bit later on in life, you're not going to be able to contribute that much. But at least if you did it during the time that you could easily contribute it, then you have that much more working for you and compounding for you on the front end so that you can kind of lull down to what you need to. And then as you get older and some of those financial obligations are paid off, then you'll be able to ramp back up. I wish I had done it that way. Um, I unfortunately didn't. I did start investing in my 20s. Um, but I kind of put the bare minimum in there because I, you know, let lifestyle creep be a bigger deal to me than, you know, making sure that I was financially secure and financially stable. And those are things that at this point I regret having done um, because it, for me it just genuinely wasn't worth it. I wish I had taken the time and even more so had the knowledge, which is really what it was, as I didn't have the knowledge. 
um, to put more in at that point in time because I had it readily available um, versus, you know, waiting until I got older and then trying to ramp up as much as I possibly could. Okay, real estate. So I would say for your first home to purchase, instead of purchasing like a single family home, try to purchase a duplex, a triplex, a quad, and rent out the other units with the exception of yours, live in it for at least two years, and then after that two years, if you want to go and purchase a home, then do so, rent out the unit you were living in, and now you have an investment property, and you have something that's making money for you on the side, so you have an extra stream of income in that property and you've built a substantial asset there and the reason that i say this is because i mean you you've got time it's so much easier to do it the first time around like at when you're a first time home buyer there's so many additional or there are so many programs available to assist you with down payments and to assist you with things so that's what i'm saying Go ahead and buy that, you know, duplex, triplex, quad, um, and then wait and have your second home be that single family home if that's truly what you desire. Because like I said, now you have a property that's making income for you that you don't have to worry about. You have renters in um, and you have extra stream, you have an extra stream of income coming in and you have another asset that's a part of your portfolio and you've increased your net worth just by making that one move okay <clears throat> next i would say if you're getting married and the two of you have never purchased homes before then i would suggest you each purchase a property separately so that you can maximize your you know financial ability um, maximize all the assets that are all the financial options that are available to you with being first-time homeowners and each purchase of a property make one of the properties an investment property so now you have extra income coming in and then live in the other property and honestly if you you know can do like I said with the first uh, with the other option and the one that you all you know decide to move into make one of the two properties be a duplex a quad or a triplex if possible make both of them be that way and then that way, like I said, live in one of the units for two years and then move out. Now you have two investment properties and then you can go purchase, like I said, after the two years, you can go purchase your single family home. So now you have two additional sources of income coming in on top of whatever you all do for employment and you have your single family home that you're living in. These are just ways to increase your finances and to establish wealth for yourself that's what the whole game goal is here is to you know create generational wealth um you know ways to establish wealth for yourself so now you have genuinely set your family up to do better financially because you've established two stream two additional streams of income through those two properties excuse me that you just purchased savings Okay, so I would say start with a starter emergency fund. And a starter emergency fund, in my opinion, is $1,000. Like I know we often hear people say, oh, $1,000 is what you need in your emergency fund. In my opinion, that's a starter emergency fund. That is not your whole total emergency fund. That's to get you started. And yes, even as a young person, you need an emergency fund. So in high school, I had a, or not in high school, as a senior in high school, I had a car. And like I said, I worked. So I had to pay for my own uh, gas. Um, <clears throat> I can't remember if I had to pay for my insurance or not. And I don't want to say that I did because I know my father is going to call me on it if he ever sees this. Um, so I'm not sure about the insurance, but I definitely had to pay for my own gas. Um, and I'm sure that there were other financial responsibilities that I had knowing my father. Um, so anyhow... I know that uh, the, what was it? The, oh, my car got broken into. I had like, I wanted a, like, it was a regular car. I had like a hatchback. Um, and 
I wanted a really nice radio so I had a new radio installed into my car where I had like a removable face that like lit up and everything and I was in my opinion I was fancy I had you know I had invested in this radio system um, because it was what I wanted and so one day I had left my face on my radio in my car and somebody broke into my car and they stole it and stole the system and everything out of the car and when they did I had to not I wasn't not only responsible or concerned about the radio but my window was broken to my car and I had to be responsible for taking care of that and had I not had some money saved then I wouldn't have been able to get the window fixed um, or get the radio replaced in that very same car the AC also went out. Now, I will tell you that I didn't have enough money to get the AC fixed. Like, I didn't know enough to have $1,000 saved up or even anything close to that um, saved up. I, like I said, I had had enough money to get the window fixed. Um, I think I did get the radio replaced. It wasn't the same type of radio that I had previously had. It was at a lower scale uh, because that was what I could afford. But like I said, the AC went out, so now I'm driving around in the heat. And then eventually the power steering went out on my vehicle. And when I tell you, it is not easy steering a vehicle that does not have power steering in it. Um, but like I said, I couldn't afford to get those things fixed, so I had to just keep it pushing. But had I been saving money and established that $1,000 starter emergency fund, then I would have been able to pay for those uh, emergencies that took place. And I tell you those stories because I'm saying an emergency is gonna happen. Like things happen all the time. You may, you know, be driving down the street and you drive through a construction zone and one of your tires gets popped and now you need a new tire. Or, you know, anything, literally anything could happen. You're driving down the street and you know, the truck in front of you kicks up a rock into your windshield and your windshield cracks. And now you have to place, replace the windshield. Like those are just car related things, but honestly, it could be literally anything. Maybe your work, you know, it can be anything. And so that's why I say, at least have that starter thousand dollar emergency fund. And so after that, after you've acquired that starter thousand dollar emergency fund, and I will tell you, when you get that thousand dollars, don't put it in your general savings account at your bank that's making, you know, 0.1% interest or 0.2% interest. Get a high yield savings account that's paying, you know, three, four, five plus percent interest. Just Google high yield savings account or, you know, best, you know, high yield savings account in whatever year it is that you're watching this video or that you're in need um, and then research those financial institutions and find one that has a you know the highest if not or a high you know percentage interest uh, account and then go for one of those I want to say that they're in the high four and five percent right now so it makes so much more sense for you to put it in a high yield interest or high yield savings account than for you to have it in your standard uh, banks or credit unions savings account where you're not making any money uh, off of your money. In a high yield savings account, you're going to get compounded interest daily and you're going to be making money off of your money that's sitting there. And so it's just going to increase the amount that you have in that savings account in the first place. Okay, so now that you have your starter emergency fund saved, your $1,000, the next thing I would say is start working towards saving up one month of expenses. Um, ultimately, you know, long term, the gain is game is six months and twelve months, but those seem so far fetched when you all I have is this thousand dollars. Like, so that's why I say baby steps. You know, start bite off enough for you to chew. So that's why I say start working on one month of expenses because that's going to be easier for you to uh, uh, obtain uh, and easier for you to accept mentally that you need to have this if you start off with a smaller amount versus going with something that's you know a, a goal that's so much larger like the six or 12 months 
you do ultimately over time need to work to achieve those but start with one month of expenses saving up for that and for that to be like your next goal for your emergency fund okay so hopefully these tips have been helpful to you and hopefully you will be able to implement them hopefully if you have you know if you're thinking about doing some of the things that I suggested that maybe you not do then hopefully this will be kind of like a sounding board or help you to reflect and be like okay maybe this isn't the best decision for me or maybe you've never encountered any of those situations before and so you know you know that this isn't something that I would ever do kudos to you um, or perhaps you can pass this information along to someone else definitely share the video with anyone that you feel would be able uh, to benefit from it if you like my shirt uh, please check out my Etsy shop uh, linked on my channel and where it is for sale along with several other wealth related uh, t-shirts and they're available in multiple colors and I would like to ask for you to like share comment and subscribe and remember to hit the notification bell so that you'll know whenever I post my next video have a good day, journey to generational wealth gang. Bye.